Hey folks, you're listening to The Idea Roastery. I'm Herman. And I'm Jason. And Jason, do you write like with a pen and paper? I, I really enjoy writing with a pen and paper. And I do it a heck of a lot. If there's, you know, like some girls are really into like stationery uh, in school. Uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm, I'm one of them. Uh, <laughs> Fair enough. Like uh, I, I love going into like uh, stationery stores and I buy like uh, either A5 pads, A4 pads. I prefer the sort of um, quads. Okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, and I've got like four or five different uh, pieces of paper or pads around me. Uh, I carry one in, in my backpack all the time because uh, I, I really enjoy the process of writing. Um, and uh, I find it's just a useful way of like jotting stuff down there and then. Right. So I've also recently bought um, a Remarkable. Oh, the, that's the e-ink one. Yeah, it's an e-ink one. So the idea is that I've got so I've got so much p- paper all over the place uh, that I, I just don't know where everything is. Uh, like I've got one pad for like work stuff, one pad for like personal stuff. And then sometimes I do like, you know, writing out a fitness plan or, or writing out, you know, how much exercise I've done or what food I'm eating. Um, so I, I do a lot of this writing, but it's all over the place. And so my idea was I'm going to try and get this like writing pad thing, but it's taken a lot, lot of time to kind of get into using that rather than the paper, uh, because it's so easy to just rip your like paper out and write it down and, and start uh, doodling. So I think that that's one of the one of the things that I really love about paper and pen specifically is just how ubiquitous it is, right? So there are very few software tools, or I'll actually say there's no there's no software tool that is that is as ubiquitous as pen and paper. You know, you've got your to do list apps, you've got your journaling apps, you've got your sketching apps, you've got all of these different uh, bits of software that are all just trying to replace an aspect of pen and paper, right? Yeah. It's like, you can do anything. Okay, not anything. You can do many, many things on yeah. pen and paper that require customized and specialized tooling to do on a computer. This is something really, really satisfying about, about writing is I'm similar to you. I've got my journal, which I take with me everywhere I go. I've got a little notebook and scratch pad for doing all the notebook and scratch paddy things. And then I've got a bunch of little cue cards that I use for keeping my sort of productivity to-do list uh, on me. And uh, I'll dig into that a little bit later. But I, I find that at one point, I not only did I try to journal digitally, I actually created a platform for journaling digitally and then found that I kind of like lost the enjoyment of journaling by typing it on my mm. computer where I've got work and emails and like it's a completely different headspace that I would find myself in and I'm like actually no I'm just going back to pen and paper and now I'm just back at a you know a couple yeah. of months of development later I'm like turns out uh, the book was better all along yeah exactly and I think it uh, leading on from our last episode about goals I find that writing is a very important part of the execution of goals uh, first of all and the second thing is that it's also a way it's in a way like an extension of your brain when that that's how I like to think about r- like writing on paper like writing is thinking it is exactly and you've got so much going on in your brain all the time uh, especially in this modern world where we've got lots of distractions. And so having a place where you can like write something down in a permanent format means that you've got a way that you can start to think about things in a more objective way, right? Because I think- So two things over there is, is uh, so this is a form of computational offloading, right? But it, But it's actually two different forms of computational offloading. The first one is that it's, uh, computational offloading in the form of memory. So that's like writing down your shopping list or reminders, stuff like that. And then the second form of computational offloading is where it assists in the thinking and not necessarily the memory. So it's actually in the computation. So that a very basic example would be um, doing calculations on a piece of paper is the paper is 
helping you to think better, right? You could mm. fuzzily extrapolate that and say like, uh, my journal helps me to think better as well because it helps me to formalize and and uh, speak about my emotions and what's going on in my head to myself and in a way that that, that is computational offloading in the form of computation and also in the form of memory. And then the third thing that you said over there that I think was, well, the third point I want to make from what you said was that it stores it in a, in a permanent format is like, as we know, you know, nothing is permanent, permanent, but paper is much more permanent than most other things is that you can reasonably open and read a book that was written, you know, 500 years ago. Yes, you will have like manuscripts where the paper has started to fade or crack or weather. Um, but like, it's really difficult to read a floppy disk right now, right? And that's not that old. Um, and so when it comes to like archiving information, it turns out that yeah. one of the most robust methods of storing information for a long period of time is to print it out and put it in a, you know, humidity controlled environment. Yeah. And there's nothing more, in, there's nothing more like sort of revealing uh, going back to something that's been written in the past and then correlating it to what has happened uh, today. Yeah. Uh, so you, you you look at like some of the, the great bloggers out there, like the, the Tim, Tim Ferriss's, the Paul Graham's. Uh, and it's, it's, yeah, as you say, like a history uh, that allows people to sort of, sort of, better understand how the world works from the fact that, you know, you've got some sort of information that someone's sharing at that time, an idea, um, and you're trying to take that idea and you're trying to apply it into the world and see whether it works or not. And in a, in a sense, you're actually informing your own uh, perspective of the world. Uh, similar to what I, I think for me, journaling is, um, it's, I mean, there's two types of journaling that I do, right? So, uh, and I, I'm not as prolific as you as a journaler, so I'll, I'll get your perspective on that as well. So there's two types of journaling that I do. The one is a bit weird. It's like autobiographical, I find it. It's basically just like writing down what I did. Um, that I find is good for a perspective of looking back and seeing what I've done. Uh, and in a way, it's helping to calibrate. What I'm going to do next in terms of like what, things I enjoy doing, what things I don't enjoy doing. Uh, because as you're writing, you can kind of tell like, oh, that was a bad experience. I, I don't really like that. This was a good one. I really want to do more of that. And so by doing it, you're also helping to inform your memory uh, because, you know, so many things happen in your life that sometimes you do forget those yeah, small things. Yeah. The other type of journaling I do is thinking journaling, where I'm trying to think about things in the future and, and trying to formulate ideas that will as I said before, help move, like uh, make a better understanding of the world. And so um, I used to do a lot of autobiographical, which after a while gets kind of boring, uh, especially if you don't have a good practice and you're doing it regularly, you end up sort of trailing behind uh, in some sense. But now mm -hmm. this year I'm doing more thinking journaling uh, where it's more like, this is an idea that I've got. Let me try and like dig a bit deeper and, and try and write something a little bit more uh, succinct about that aspect of it or that aspect of it. And then in this process, I'm like developing my own way of thinking. Um, I don't know if yours is the same. So similar, similar. Um, so it, when, when you talk about autobiographical journaling is you're absolutely right. When you just document your days, it starts to get really boring. However, uh, I still do that. Right. And so most of my days are actually just like a paragraph long, right? It's like, you know, had a good gym session this morning, uh, did a little bit of work. I met up with a friend for coffee and we chatted about X, Y, Z and that's it. However, the reason why I still do it is let's take, for instance, I had an interesting conversation over lunch, but it's not sitting with me. Like I'm not thinking about that conversation currently while I'm journaling. Be like, oh, and I met up with a friend for lunch and we spoke about X and then I'm like, Ah, okay. So there's actually a couple of things I want to unpack over there. I found it really interesting how X relates to Y. And it has got me thinking about this new idea that I want to play around with at some point in the future. And so in a way, it kind of like ties into that analytical form of thinking that you were talking about in terms of like future planning 
um, but more, uh, but more um, holistic. So it's like, I'm now thinking about my mental process uh, with regards to say that idea that I had with a friend over lunch. Then the second thing that I find really interesting about the this autobiographical form of journaling is that most people only ever experience a day once, right? And then they never see that day again. And I get to experience every day twice, right? It's like, I sit down, I'm like, okay, what happened during the day? I did X and Y. I felt pretty good in the morning. I didn't feel pretty good in the afternoon. Maybe it has to do with what I ate. Maybe it has to do with, you know, the, uh, the work that I was doing that I wasn't enjoying, um, or something. Right. But I always have a second look at my day. And I like that because it means that, you know, if nothing, if I have no other reflection period at all, I revisit each day. And it also means that I remember my days a lot better because I have had a second look at them. Um, and I and I really I really appreciate that about journaling. Is to be entirely honest, I I don't read my old journals. Every now and then I'll flick through one. I'll be like, oh, there's you know 2017 Harman. He's hitchhiking through Morocco. What a cutie! Um, but it's more the process of journaling that is the important part of it for me, and not necessarily having the actual documentation. It's like I'd be sad if my my journals got caught in a house fire, but it wouldn't change much because the purpose of it is the doing of it yeah exactly and i like it that it's almost like you're keeping yourself accountable in a sense uh especially when it comes to like achieving goals and uh doing more with with this this uh life that we have is that you can kind of i think one thing that you s said to me once is that it's a good way of picking up on monotony uh, like when, when you're doing the same thing over and over again, it's kind of an indication that, Hey, maybe this weekend I should, uh, go and, you know, play in a forest or go and, you know, go to the seaside or do something that's a bit outside of the comfort zone. Yes. Yeah, like when you look at your journal and it's like, this could have been any day, you're like, okay, I need to do, I need to change something up. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And I find, I find like Mondays and Tuesdays are like the, those days for me, it's pretty much, <laughs> I can almost get like one of those ink stamps. Just, <laughs> yeah, stamp just like, Oh, there's Monday like, done. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's got the whole thing written out. Um, so, so yeah, I, I, I think I agree on you with you in terms of like the, the practice. And I think what I've heard a lot recently is about the emotional side of it is that in like writing out like about like certain traumas it can also be a way to sort of bring a bit more objectivity into those uh, experiences and so there's a, th a thread about how it can actually improve your mental well-being by having this place where you can just basically say anything get it out of your get it off your chest uh, and also confront some of those uh, sort of emotional challenges in the past Absolutely. Absolutely. It's kind of like, I, I won't equate it directly to therapy because therapy, you have a practitioner who's trying to guide you through this, but the part of therapy where you try to understand and vocalize your feelings is a very important aspect of therapy, right? Um, I think that there's a, the same could be said, uh, said for, uh, let's say prayer, right? the act of praying to whichever divinity you you believe in is you have to look inside of you and say what am i feeling and thinking and then you have to vocalize it right you have to put it into you have to like summarize it and you have to say hey deity uh here is how i feel um etc cetera, etc cetera. and so in in many ways um, a journal is kind of that. It's like you have to reflect on yourself and then figure out what it is that you're feeling or try to at least verbalize what it is that you're feeling. And I think the practice of just doing that is such a good way to like get a, a handle on your mental health. Yeah, I completely agree. And moving from and moving from the um internal aspects of like journaling uh diaries and those kind of things to the external in terms of blogs 
what is your process when it comes to ideating a blog? Oh man. Okay. So I've been doing a lot of writing. Well, blog post, not a whole blog. Cause I mean, there's some people out there who have like multiple blogs, <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, but, yeah. you know, um, so I've, I've been doing a lot of writing this year, uh, and I writing for other people is really difficult. It has to be a lot more polished than your journal, obviously, but you're, you're also writing with the intent to inform, which means that it needs to be legible. You can't like take previous knowledge for granted. Like I, I write for a semi-technical audience, which means that I can get away with, you know, using some jargon here and there without explaining every concept. Um, but the way that I, that I write is I actually keep a Trello board of ideas that come to me from conversations that I have with people or I'm, you know, at the gym or taking a walk and I'm really like, you know, Cape Town does need more trees. So I'd be like, that would be a pretty good blog post episode, right? It's actually very similar to, to how we come up with ideas for, for podcasts is we'll be discussing something or we'll have, like, have an idea and then be like, yeah, this would be interesting to unpack in some way. So my most recent blog post was just, it was writing about my learning process of um, learning how to use a new SDK to build a small video game for the Playdate, the little handheld game console. And uh, what I do is that that goes onto the, the Trello board at some point when I think of it. And because it's now on the Trello board, over the next week, weeks, depending on when I get to writing it, it's sitting there stirring in my mind. So I think about something else that goes into this blog post and I kind of like start, I don't want to say writing it, but structuring it in my head. Hmm. Then at some point I will open up my tax editor and I will write a basic structure for it. I won't write any actual, you know, words to be published. It'd just be like, you know, here's what I, I'm working on. Here's how I learn different things. I do X and Y and a little bit about the play date, a little bit about the, the game I'm building. Cool. Then now that I've got that internal structure, who knows, maybe a couple more days will pass and then when I finally sit down to, to write it, I've got a good cohesive idea of what I'm writing about. And I'll write the first draft and I won't edit it. The editing comes on another day. I know, I know, I know this sounds like a really, really long process, but I'm only publishing like once every week, once every two weeks. And so I, I have the ability to have a couple of days between each step of the process. And I have like three posts that I haven't like three completed blog posts that I haven't posted yet because it's just about like staying with that consistently and always having it on the move and it crawls along but it yeah. just builds up it builds up it builds up it builds up do you set aside a, a specific time because that's another factor that I think a lot of people get uh sort of wound up in is that they feel like they have to have a creative spurt in order to write something do you do you have like you're sitting on a couch and then all of a sudden you feel like oh i should write about this i, I feel like the words are coming out of my <laughs> account kind of coming out of my brain and they want to go into a piece of paper or do you like sit down very very rarely with any creative field whether it be writing or making art or programming or whatever waiting for inspiration is it's not going to get you anywhere um every now and then yes i am feeling inspired to write However, the best way to get inspired to write is to write, right? So what I do is um, as soon as I sit down at my yeah. desk on any given workday morning, so this is generally after coffee and gym or a walk or something, and I, before I even open my laptop, I journal, right? So that only takes five to 10 minutes, depending on if I have much to say. And then before I get into like the emails and stuff, I've got, 20 minutes of doing something writing related. So this could be editing something that I'd written a couple of days ago. This could be structuring my thoughts on a specific topic. So like the pre first draft, this could be writing a first draft of something, or it could be something like, you know, the finishing touches, putting it on my blog, pressing publish, and then sending an email off to my, to my subscribers. And by just putting 15 to 20 minutes aside, her work day, so five days a week, man, I get a lot done. I get a lot written. Uh, and 
then I get fan mail and people like send me like, Hey man, I really like the blog. I really like what you have to say. I'm like, I'll oh, stop you. And then I get another email from someone who's like, <laughs> Hey man, uh, don't you know that tax is just uh, governmental theft and maybe you should learn, <laughs> learn about stuff before you write and put that shit online. I'm like, oh, yeah. <laughs> okay, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> I, I guess that that is an element of it, right? It's like you're putting you're putting your thoughts into the world, and so there is an element of uh, I guess with blogging is that you want to have some of that feedback. Uh, I mean, similar to like why why we're doing this podcast is like having that sort of feedback to check in on like that you're not thinking in a way that's like completely you know out there and not grounded in actual reality, and so. There, there is elements of that. Well, it's also why we talk about uh, uh, ideas and why I write about ideas as opposed to like current issues because like, hey, we're we're not having an episode about Israel and Palestine, right? Yeah. Because yeah. that's just recipe for disaster, no matter what we say. Um, and yeah. the same thing applies to my blog is like, I'm playing around with ideas and yes sometimes the some sometimes i will have people who disagree with those ideas but because it's not like a political or social issue these ideas it's more just people saying like yeah i kind of uh disagree that goal setting is a useful thing right because maybe you should just live your life fair enough that's your opinion yeah like we're yeah. we're all it, despite disagreeing we're all happy here <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah exactly and I, I think that's one of the great things about the internet is that you can just like write pretty much whatever you want and uh i mean not whatever but you know like it, it is a f format where you can just kind of be like yo this is me this is what i do i want to write about the the meal i had last night or the you know trip i took to spain uh, and yeah you can kind of have your disagreements about it but i won't hear about it because i won't publish my email address <laughs> and i i have so as you know I, I run a blogging platform called bear and if you go into the discovery feed you'll see that there's a whole bunch of people writing about mostly just their day-to-day -day lives you know there's a couple of people who are using it as a second language english blog where they just write about things they find interesting or about the games that they've recently played uh, there was a period of time where a there was a person who owned a vegan sandwich shop in Seoul in Korea, and he would just like write about what it's like to run a sandwich shop, hmm. and I loved it. I loved just like these slices of life in longer form content than what Instagram provides, hmm. and it's less curated and it's more raw because people are talking about like what they're thinking and feeling and what they're doing as opposed to just like picture of a cappuccino yeah exactly and I, I like that element of it it's it's like you're you're kind of stepping into the mind of that person and uh, almost you know living multiple lives through the writing of others and I think it's important to think about as I guess as you write is that even though you're just writing it and putting it out there there's a chance that like one or two people will read it and it'll be really influential into either the way they think about something or maybe it inspires them to do something else uh, and so there is an element of like, even with a small audience, you can kind of take a bit of like confidence and, and saying like, oh, you know, maybe someone will, will, uh, you know, enjoy what I've written and, you know, think about it for a, a few minutes a day, you know, hundred percent. So I, I was having a conversation this morning. Um, I just, I just finished reading Outlive by Peter Atia. I'm sure mm. you're familiar with oh, yeah. <laughs> his work. So Peter Atia's book is definitively good. And I would recommend it to people. However, it is one of those books, and I, I don't mean this as a um, as something negative about the book or as like a diss or anything, but it could have been a long essay. It could have been a blog post, right? Or a series of blog posts. Mm. It didn't need to be a full book because there's this... There's this um, idea that a book needs to be over X amount of words or X amount of pages to be considered like not a leaflet, right? And what I see regularly happening, especially with people who study social sciences, so you're like Nassim Talibs, is they have a, a novel idea and maybe some research that they've done. And they're like, okay, cool. I need to publish this. Now, the this would be awesome as a blog post. Right. 
fucking great. Um, but they're like, hey, listen, I want to be a, a book author. So the chapter one is pretty much the book. And then chapters two to seven yeah. are all just like rehashing that same stuff again and again and again. And, uh, and I'm like, I get it. People want to publish books because that's actually how you make money from your ideas. Um, we're starting to see a research. Well, we're starting to see people monetize their blogs in the form of like Substack and other platforms, paid newsletters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so what you're talking about is almost like the, I don't want to say the bastardization, but like <laughs> basically taking taking writing and and using it for for nefarious reasons, right? I don't know if it's nefarious, right? It's... I mean, it wouldn't. No, but I, like. In in that case, I, I like I think you're right that there is a trend, and it's I think it's also part of there's a thing called audience building, right? Like so, you build an audience, and then you, as long as you've got you know plus a hundred thousand uh, followers, uh, it's very easy to uh, well the next stage is to try and monetize that audience in some way, and so I wouldn't be surprised if publishing a book. I'm not saying it's specific to uh, Peter Tia. But I, and I haven't read the book, so I, I can't really com comment on it. But I think there is a trend where I've seen people who are just like, you know, how to build an AI chatbot or how to use AI in the 21st century uh, as like a way to just quickly sell like a book. Um, and I think that element of writing is is becoming more common. And it maybe is also shown in, I think Malcolm Gladwell had a book, uh, David and Goliath, which was based on a paper with a really small subset yeah. of uh, people. I think there was a whole controversy about that. And it's also the same thing, although he's probably got a lot, he's got a nicer way of stringing thoughts together. Although sometimes I, I just don't like how he just keeps you on the edge for so long. It doesn't get to the damn point, <laughs> Malcolm. Uh, yeah, but I think there is an element of, of of that too, right? Where it's like you've got an audience, you need to have a bit of money, and so you yeah. publish a book, uh, so that you can just monetize your audience. So outside of the monetization aspect, is there's 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 also really good reason to write outside of informing, and it's similar to journaling in that respect. Is that um, it's one of the reasons why this podcast is awesome. Is let's take for instance, you want to learn about a new subject or uh, just a, a concept, right? how better to explore it than to write something about it or you know set up a semi formal discussion about it right is it, it, let's say for instance we well, i i wanted to learn about geoengineering well yes i could go and i could just like read wikipedia articles about different geoengineering techniques and you know look up look up the papers and the history of it but writing about it or having a podcast discussion about it incentivizes me to actually go and read those because there's purpose behind it. I am writing an article and I am doing research for that article as opposed to just like hand wavy nebulous. This is interesting. I'm going to read about it. And, and I really like that because it, note taking is a great way to learn, right? Uh, if you just go and listen to a lecture in university, you're going to retain very, very little of it. Whereas if you try and summarize what the lecturer is saying, you're going to retain a lot more of it. Um, and in a way, writing is essentially trying to take a complex complex topic and verbalize it, similar to what we were talking about with journaling, where you're just trying to understand it to a deeper degree so that you can explain it well in the written word, in a written form. Um, and to me, my blog does that uh, definitely. It's like, do I do I... Am I learning about something? This is a good way to like, you know, uh, really secure yeah. those learnings in there. Yeah. It's like that saying is that the best way to learn something is to teach it to someone else. So I guess in the same sense, you're basically just, although not teaching necessarily, you're you're kind of informing. You know, someone might read <laughs> yeah. it and inform. Um, yeah. So th there's a couple of tools that I think you just mentioned as well. Uh, the one is your your blog, uh, Bear Blog. Uh, Bearblog.dev, everyone. The other one that I find quite interesting, if you can just touch on, is the the Trello board. Like, uh, that's another form of writing. Um, how how is your how big is your Trello board? How many like columns do you have? Ah, uh, dude, I've got so many Trello boards though. Uh, I've got a Trello board for ideas. I've got a Trello board for my writing. I've got a Trello board for Bear Blog to to track things that I'm working on and my other company. Um, and I have a Trello board called the Lair, which is what Emma and I 
used to keep track of stuff that we need to buy for the apartment. Uh, <laughs> um, but it, for for those who who are unfamiliar with Trello, it's like uh, it's a platform that allows you to create lists and cards for those lists that can be dragged between different lists. So I can have like four columns that is to do in progress done. And then I can create a new card that says, uh, write about um, how trees work. And that's now on my list of ideas. This is my to write, to do. And then when I'm writing it, I can drag it over in the in the in progress. And then when it's complete, I can drag it over into the done. Or we can add another column and I can say like a to publish because you know you really want to like space out when you're publishing your articles. Um, and so I, I find Trello to just be the most easy to use out of all of these tools. And I think that it deviates a little bit from uh, what I said earlier about <laughs> paper being the most useful thing in that it changes so frequently that if you tried to keep track of it with paper, you would just have yeah. crosses out and then, you know, stuff rewritten. Um, so it makes sense in this context, like where the software is actually better than the paper alternative. Yeah, it's actually like I, I use it a little bit. It's kind of like to do lists on steroids. I mean, it, it's like yeah, it's it's really it's really cool. Uh, um, although I find like I I take a bit of the element of writing on paper into Trello, and so I think you kind of need to be a bit more of a a gardener and prune out ideas and those kind of things. Because I would I just find I like bash a whole bunch of things into there. And then like, <laughs> I will kind of like forget about it for like a week or two. And then I go back and I'm like, what, what's this? Like who wrote this? Is this me? Yeah, a good way, a good way to manage that is to set Trello as your, um, what do you call it? The new, new, new tab in your browser. Oh yeah. Right. That's or like your home screen in your browser, because yeah. this way it's, it's always at the forefront where this is like your, uh, to do card and your digital workspace. And yeah. so you move everything around over there and you try to keep it clean um, and, another, and you never really forget about it. Yeah, exactly. Another one is actually the automations. Those are quite cool. So like you can, yeah. like after a certain time, move it to a different tab and you can kind of just look at the tab and say, okay, these are not really important and this one. Maybe I want to drag. Yeah. It it, it's got a lot of, a lot of depth to it. You can even do stuff like hook it up to GitHub so that it creates a GitHub issue and then link it to a branch and then when that branch gets merged to master it automatically moves it over to the complete yeah um yeah, but i don't do any of that yeah exactly <laughs> i mean now we're just turning into trello shills now <laughs> uh yeah yeah but uh yeah i think this um, is good yeah this is this has been a good one uh to everyone listening thanks for for tuning in and if you want to see this show grow and thrive please share this episode with someone you know Cheers. Cheers.